but I can give you an overview of the situation in the light of the Bible. First, let's look at Vladimir Putin. The last 12 months have been remarkable ones for the president of Russia. He further solidified his control over Russia. So much so that even Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, recently denounced him for human rights abuses. He took in Edward Snowden and allowed the NSA whistleblower to continue leaking documents that embarrassed the United States and lowered its standing in the world. He bamboozled President Obama into making a deal with Syria over its chemical weapons, an agreement Syria clearly never intended to keep. He helped broker another deal that removed the sanctions on Iran while allowing them to keep their nuclear program. He continued to serve as Iran's protector in the United Nations and the world community and is now in the midst of helping arm Iran for future battles against Israel and the United States. He turned the new Egyptian government away from friendship with the U.S. and rebuilt old alliances between Egypt and Russia. He hosted the Winter Olympic Games and was highly praised by NBC Olympics host Bob Costas. The Daily Caller's senior editor, Jamie Weinstein, wrote, If all you know about Vladimir Putin is what you learned from Bob Costas during the NBC's Olympic coverage Thursday night, you might be excused for thinking the Russian autocrat is a great peacemaker on the world stage. For a minute, NBC looked an awful lot like a Russian propaganda network. Among other things, Costas said, just in the past year, Putin brokered a deal to allow Syria to avoid a U.S. military strike by giving up its chemical weapons and help bring Iran to the negotiating table over its nuclear intentions. Costas failed to mention that in both of those cases, Putin's real success was his ability to outmaneuver a slow-footed and naive U.S. administration. After the Olympics, though, it was business as usual in Russia with dissidents harassed, beaten, and jailed, and with opposition media shut down. In October of last year, Forbes named Vladimir Putin the most powerful person in the world, ahead of the President of the United States. If his personal wealth were not so shrouded in secrecy, it would probably have named him the world's richest person as well. Last year, Putin was required by Russian law to reveal his salary and net worth. He said he makes a salary of $187,000 and is worth about $180,000. But he was clearly lying. A man with a net worth of $180,000 does not openly wear luxury watches with a known value of over $700,000. He owns a palace on the Black Sea, estimated to be worth a billion dollars. He owns 20 other mansions around the world. The website, therichest.com, estimates his net worth at $75 billion. That's not bad for a civil servant. A man who has spent his life, not in the private sector, but on the government payroll, somehow turned that government salary into one of the world's great fortunes. Not that he actually needs it. There are a lot of perks that go along with just being the most powerful man in the world. One is that your constituents take care of every conceivable luxury. The Russian government provides Putin with 15 presidential helicopters and 40 private jets, several of them featuring gold-plated interiors. It gives him the use of four luxury yachts. One of them is 176 feet long, has a spa pool, a waterfall, and a wine cellar. Another is even more opulent with four decks, a jacuzzi, a barbecue, a maple wood colonnade, and a bathroom faced in marble. A net worth of 75 billion is generally consistent with most media estimates. It would make him the third richest man in the world if that's true. But there are strong indications that the actual numbers are much higher. In fact, 
He is probably the wealthiest man on earth. But he wants more than luxury, and he wants more than to top some magazine lists of the world's most powerful. He wants to rule and reign like the czars of his nation's history and the Soviet dictators of his youth. Except he wants to succeed where they failed. He wants Russia to rule as the world's only superpower while he rules Russia. Then in the midst of Putin's glorious turn on the world stage, little Ukraine had the temerity to reign on his parade. Vladimir Putin wants Russia to rule as the world's only superpower, while he rules Russia. So he didn't take kindly to upstart Ukraine, throwing out Viktor Yanukovych, Putin's puppet head of their government. In Yanukovych's place, the Ukrainian chose Alexander Chertanov as acting president. Chertanov is an evangelical Christian a Baptist who often fills the pulpit in various churches around the country. With their revolution, the Ukrainians were throwing out more than the corrupt Yanukovych, though. They were throwing off Putin and the death grip Russia has held on them since the 19th century. Vladimir Putin could not allow that. In 2005, he characterized the collapse of the old Soviet empire as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century. And in the years since, he has worked to bring the old Soviet satellite states back into the fold. When the nation of Georgia got out of line in 2008, Putin solved the problem by sending troops. You would expect an international backlash led by the United States, but George W. Bush was at the end of his administration, making him a lame duck. And at the same time, he was trying to grapple with a worldwide economic collapse. He spoke out against Putin's military action, but did little else. The new president, Barack Obama, wanted a new relationship with Russia. Understandably, he didn't want his first act toward Russia to be that of imposing sanctions. So he did nothing. In fact, in early 2009, President Obama sent then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to a Geneva meeting with the Russian foreign minister. She carried the gift of a reset button. They pushed it together, letting bygones be bygones. And Putin got away with the invading of a sovereign state for no good reason other than a lust for power and control. He paid no price then and expects to pay no price now. Ukraine was once the jewel of the Soviet Union, only about the size of Texas. In 2011, it was the third largest grain exporter in the world. Its fertile land has long made it a prize for conquering powers. But it is with Russia that Ukraine seems most completely linked. At the end of the first millennia AD, the areas now known as Ukraine and Western Russia formed a single nation, one of the most powerful in the world of that time, Kievan Rus. Russia conquered and annexed Ukraine several times over the centuries. 17% of the Ukrainians are ethnic Russians. 24% speak Russian as their primary language. Almost all of these are located in the eastern part of the country, the part that borders Russia and the Black Sea. Ukrainian life under Soviet rule was especially severe. One of Joseph Stalin's man-made famines killed at least 10 million Ukrainians. The Russians built a nuclear power plant in the Ukrainian city of Chernobyl. I'm sure you know how that turned out. The worst nuclear accident in history. Ukraine declared independence in 1991 when the Soviet Union fell apart. But the pull of Russia remained strong. Russia is their largest trading partner. They depend almost entirely on Russia for energy. But Ukraine is just as important to Putin. Russia's critical natural gas pipelines in Europe run through Ukraine. Mostly landlocked, much of Russian history is built around the quest 
to secure warm water ports, that is, ports that do not freeze over in the winter. The Russians' naval base on Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula has long given them their best, most consistent access to the oceans of the world even during the winter. Put simply, Ukraine is too strategic for Russia to lose. Late last year, the European Union offered Ukraine a trade and association agreement. In response, Putin offered to buy $15 billion worth of Ukrainian government bonds and cut the high price he was charging Ukrainians for natural gas if Ukraine rejected the EU's offer. Not surprisingly, President Yanukovych went with Putin. This triggered the massive protest movement that eventually brought Yanukovych down. The people didn't want more of the same. They saw the possibility for prosperity in European-style democracy and strong ties to the West, including membership in NATO and perhaps the EU itself. Late last month, the protesters seemed to win. Yanukovych fled the country. A new interim government was set up and elections were set for May. But losing Ukraine was just too much for the most powerful man in the world. With his naval base already in Crimea, Putin had a foothold and a landing site for more troops. He began the invasion with Russian troops in full fatigues and body armor. However, he covered all insignias as if to hide that identity of the invaders. Some came in trucks with no markings or license plates. Not only is Russia pouring thousands of regular troops into the Crimea, it has attempted to capture, occupy, or isolate Ukraine's military and governmental facilities in the region. Russia has even demanded the surrender of at least two of Ukraine's warships in the area. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said the Russian invasion of Ukraine could be a very dangerous situation if this continues in a very provocative way. Well, wake up, Mr. Hagel. We're already there. The dangerous situation is staring us right in the face. In the military, we still have vast numbers of men and women who love God and sacrifice for the good of America and the world every day. But their work is being undermined by the systematic imposition of immorality thrust on them by civilian leadership. In the last few years, they've been asked to do more and more with less and less. Then, only a couple of weeks ago, it got worse, much worse. As the world grows dramatically less stable with the imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Obama administration announced that it was dramatically cutting our national defense budget. The Army will be smaller than it was before World War II, a war we almost lost because we weren't prepared. Major weapons systems are being eliminated along with the benefits to service members. Just when we need to be at our strongest, we've chosen to become our weakest. When Ukraine declared its independence following the fall of the Soviet Union, it had the third largest nuclear weapons arsenal on the planet. But because the United States and the United Kingdom and Russia signed a treaty guaranteeing the sanctity of its borders, Ukraine gave up that nuclear arsenal. Apparently, they trusted the wrong people. Russia has now broken that treaty. And the United States and the United Kingdom are too weak to enforce it. If Ukraine still had nuclear weapons, you can be sure that Vladimir Putin would not be invading them today. History keeps teaching that weakness encourages aggression. And history also teaches us that we learn nothing from history. The Ukrainians are seeing it right now. Why can't we see it? Military strength does not encourage war. Weakness does. Senator John McCain recently said of Putin, he's amoral, he's cold, he's distant, 
he's tough. This week, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel phoned President Obama to tell him about her recent conversation with Putin. It's reported that she said that Putin seems out of touch with reality. Sources close to the president said that Merkel characterized him as in another world. Hey, that's kind of scary for the leader of the land of Magog. Certainly, a background of community organizing did not prepare our president for dealing with a man like that. President Obama warned Russia not to move militarily on Ukraine, but what does a warning from the United States mean these days? We draw lines and our enemies dance right across them. In response, we bow and say, we're sorry. Several news outlets characterize the president's comments on Ukraine as tough. Here's an example of his tough speech. The United States will stand with the international community in affirming that there will be costs for any military intervention in Ukraine. He could have simply said, there will be costs. Instead, he said, we will affirm with the international community that there will be costs. He's trying to intimidate Putin with the idea that we're going to get together with our friends and affirm that we might do something. Affirm is not a tough word. After layers of disclaimers, he finally mentioned the word costs. But what will those costs be? He doesn't dare say. He doesn't even hint. It's like a frightened kid standing far away from the bully and yelling, you'll be sorry. Then, to show where his heart is, the president went across town to a Democratic Party event where he declared, it's Friday. It's after five. So this is now officially happy hour with the Democratic Party. The next day, as it became obvious that Russia had begun invading Ukraine, already taking over Crimea, the president's national security team met. But it was Saturday, and apparently still happy hour. Happy hour hadn't ended because Obama didn't bother to join them. In what I believe to be a courageous move, Secretary of State John Kerry agreed to go to Ukraine and show U.S. solidarity with the new government there. But it's probably too late for symbolic gestures. The free world needs leadership and doesn't have it. I believe we're now beginning to see how easily the end times predictions of the ancient prophets can come true. Ezekiel prophesied that Russia and its leader, identified as in scripture as Gog of Magog, would lead an alliance headed by Iran, identified in scripture as Persia, to attack Israel. Until now, the world has assumed that America's guarantee of Israel's security was enough to dissuade this kind of coalition or invasion. But now, we see that America's guarantees are worthless and mean nothing to the rest of the world exactly as the Bible prophets predicted for these days. Since the late 1950s, I've been proclaiming that in the last days of the last days, the United States will fall from being a world power. The Bible describes the geopolitical situation of the last days in detail, but never mentions anything that sounds like the United States. It may still be around in some form, but so diminished from its present position as to be of negligible importance to world events. Bible prophecy clearly teaches that world power will shift to Rome. It is from there that a man out of the ancient Roman culture and people will rule the world through a ten-nation confederacy, and his name will be the Antichrist. When I started teaching this 55 years ago, America was on top of the world. Through the years, I watched our country decline. There were times of rejuvenation, and good things happened along the, with the bad. But overall, it's been downhill. For a long time, though, the U.S. decline didn't seem to be fitting with the speed of other end-time events. 
Then sometime in the 1990s, the pace quickened. The U.S. decline became increasingly obvious. Our decline continued at an ever-accelerating pace. Even though I knew it was coming, the acceleration of decline in the last five years has left me utterly stunned. Skydivers use the term ground rush to describe how it feels when they're in free fall and the ground is rushing up to meet them. That's what this feels like. In just a few years, our slow decline turned into a free fall with the ground rushing up to meet us. The biggest factor in our decline has been immorality. Most of the powerful institutions of America now openly revile God and his followers. That includes government, education, entertainment, and now, judging by recent campaigns, even the business community. The country has openly embraced not just homosexuality, but a plethora of sexual perversions. Another factor is violence. God hates violence. But America not only loves it, but praises those who practice it. And the more aberrant, the better. In the 1970s, we saw shocking violence on our movie screens. But today, most movies aren't as bad as the shows on network television. Ironically, TV critics say that we've entered a new golden age of television. Violence in the streets is beginning to mimic the violence in our games, songs, and TV shows. Face-off between Russia and the West over Ukraine, a superpower conflict that echoes the Cold War. ABC's Martha Raddatz and Terry Moran both on the scene. Martha in Paris, right in the middle of some high-stakes diplomacy. Good morning, Martha. It should be tense and frank, especially after that provocative missile launch. Was it a routine missile test or blatant show of force? That is the question many in the international community are asking this morning after Russia's intercontinental ballistic missile launch Tuesday. A test launch fired over the Caspian Sea and landing in a remote part of Kazakhstan. U.S. officials say the missile test had been planned well before the unfolding crisis in Ukraine, calling it a previously notified and routine test launch of an ICBM. It's time we woke up about Vladimir Putin. It's time that this administration got real. Well, if given the orders, they'll fight, and Russia keeps tightening the screws here. As you just pointed out, two more anti-missile batteries, Ukrainian anti-missile batteries, now under de facto Russian control. Ukrainian ships bottled up in the harbor by Russian warships. There's no question this whole place remains on a nice edge. Now to Ukraine, where there were new reports of violence on the ground and late word from the Pentagon that Russian aircraft entered Ukrainian airspace on several occasions in the last 24 hours. There were also escalating verbal assaults between Kiev and Moscow. Thick smoke marked the day's major flashpoint, Slavyansk, where pro-Russian separatists hold sway. A Ukrainian military helicopter exploded as it sat on an airfield, hit by bullets or rocket fire. Later, gunmen in Slavyansk seized a bus carrying international mediators. The separatist leader there claimed a spy for the Kiev government was on board. I've heard that there was somebody there from the military headquarters. People who come here as observers from the European Union bring a real spy with them. It doesn't look good at all. This is an example of the policy of double standards. Ukraine's foreign ministry confirmed it lost contact with observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. At the same time, Kiev said government forces were beginning a full blockade of Slavyansk, a day earlier, troops killed several gunmen at a checkpoint there. The Ukrainian military moves prompted a new blast today from Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, in Moscow. Some 160 tanks, some 250 armored personnel carriers are waging war with their own people. This is a bloody crime, and those who push the army to do that will pay, I am sure, and will face justice. Russian forces were on the move as well in maneuvers. Ukrainian officials claimed they had come within 1,100 yards of the border. 
and acting Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk sounded an alarm. Military aggression by Russia on Ukraine's territory will lead to military conflict in Europe. The world has not yet forgotten World War II, but Russia already wants to start World War III. Last night, Secretary of State John Kerry had accused Moscow of fomenting trouble in Ukraine in direct violation of last week's agreement in Geneva. If Russia continues in this direction, it will not just be a grave mistake, it will be an expensive mistake. But Russia's Lavrov rejected the criticism today. He insisted the separatists in eastern Ukraine will lay down their arms under the Geneva Accord only when nationalist protesters in Kiev disband their camps. From South Korea today, President Obama said again, the U.S. and European nations are ready to ratchet up the economic pressure on Russia. What's also important is uh, laying the groundwork so that if and when we see even greater escalation, perhaps even a military incursion uh, by Russia into Ukraine, that we're prepared for the sort of sectoral sanctions that would have even larger consequences. There was fresh evidence that Russia was already feeling the effects of the initial round of sanctions. The ratings agency Standard & Poor's downgraded Russia's credit rating for the first time in five years to just one notch above junk status. The S&P warned more downgrades could follow if tighter sanctions were imposed and capital flight from the country was not stemmed. Сверху смотри, он реально в котловане находится. 